Good evening, and welcome to the Scientific Adventures of Beard Man. Today, we're going to look at colors. Always reminds me of the Sean Penn movie in the 80s about the Crips and the Bloods. Colors, colors, I'm a might nightmare walking, psychopath talking, king of my crib. Yeah, anyways, um, so we're looking at colors, and how, in other words, we're looking at how the eye perceives light. Mostly, we're going to talk about color. Well, the eye has two uh, types of uh, photosensitive uh, cells in it that send information to your brain. It's got a third kind that deals with uh, contraction of your retina and some other things like that. But we're going to focus on the rods and the cones, which are the, the two types. Your eye has about 120 million rods and only about 6 million cones. These use what are called photoreceptor proteins, which when the light strikes it, it basically sends a signal to your brain. Okay, So it says, this cell has received light. First, let's look at cones. Uh, each, uh, each kind of cone cell, and there are three types, uh, is sensitive to a particular wavelength of light. So if we take a look at this color-sensitive chart here, we can see that the three types are the red, the green, and the blue, or sometimes called blue-violet, um, uh, cones. And the graph here indicates how sensitive it is to that particular wavelength. So we can see the red here is kind of uh, sensitive in this range here, and that's where it's most sensitive, and as we go to either side it gets less sensitive to that light, meaning if the peak of that red uh, red parabola, close enough, um, uh, if the peak of that curve, if light at the, that wavelength hits it, it's very likely to, to uh, absorb it and send a signal to your brain. Whereas if it's light out here on the very side of that, the very edge, uh, then you have to have a whole lot of light to get some of it to absorb and send a signal to your brain. Okay, each of these uh, cones is approximately uh, it's between 0.5 and 4 micrometers, which comes out to an approximate width or diameter of about 10,000 atoms. Okay, so you can see, uh, like we talked about in the last video, it's not too likely to have fo two photons hit the same chemical bond. But here we're dealing with a much bigger cell, and so you get many photons hitting it uh, as light is being taken into the eye. So that, that's how we see light. We're going to come back to that in just a moment. Um, and, and those are, it takes a, a lot of photons to stimulate each cone. If we get into a dark room, there, 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 aren't, enough, uh, there aren't enough photons to stimulate those cones. So essentially the cones shut down because there isn't enough light to stimulate them. The rods, however, are far more sensitive to light. A single photon can stimulate a, a rod cell in your eye and send a signal to your brain saying that it received light. But you'll notice there's only one, uh, one kind of rod. Okay? Therefore, all it can tell, it can't tell what wavelength it is, all it can tell is, was it stimulated or was it not stimulated? In other words, should I perceive this as white? Or should I perceive it as black? Okay. Now, if it gets stimulated a whole lot of times, it might be a brighter white, and so you could say there's a gray scale. Okay, that you see uh, when you're using your rods, which is when there's not much light. So you go into a dark room, you turn off, you go into a room, turn off all the lights, your eyes begin to adjust, those rods begin to become sensitive as the level of light has decreased. Because there's only one kind of rod we see in black and white when it's dark. Okay, uh, Let's get back to color. That's what I want to spend the majority of our time talking about today. Okay, So you'll notice with, with, with this color sensitivity chart that we have here, if we um, had a wavelength of light coming at our eyes that was 670 nanometers, all the photons were 670 nanometers, Okay, that's going to stimulate this red cone quite a bit. Okay, and so that cone is going to be firing, and we're going to get red messages to our brain, and there's not going to be much green 
or blue-violet being stimulated, they get pretty low over there. And so but we're going to interpret that color as red, okay? because only the red cone is sending signals. If we have a wavelength of, say, 530 nanometers, okay, then that green cone is going to just be firing. Those cones are going to be absorbing that light, and they're going to be firing signals to our brain, and we're going to see green. Okay, and the red and the blue aren't going to be sending much signals, and so our brain interprets that as green. And if we had light around 420 nanometers, then we'd be stimulating the uh, blue and the violet, the blue violet, or the blue cone, and it would be going like crazy. Although it takes a little bit more light, it's not quite as sensitive. Um, but that's the only one really that would be sending much signals. The other ones, it's even worse over there in that range around 420, and so our brain would interpret that as blue. Because we have these three kinds of cones, these are called our three primary colors. Because really, we're always seeing a combination of these three, because you only have three kinds of cones, and there are three types of messages that can get sent to your brain. The color depends on what ratio of those signals are being received by your brain. Okay. Now, what happens if we get a wavelength in between, like 580 nanometers? Okay, That one you can see is kind of in between the red and the green cone, and so it's really going to kind of stimulate both of them. And so the red cones are sending red messages to your brain, the green cone is sending green messages to your brain, and how does your brain deal with that? Well, when it gets red and green messages, it interprets that as yellow. When we're getting red and green, we see yellow. So that wavelength, 580 nanometers, our brain interprets as yellow because it's equally stimulating the red and the green cones. Okay? Well, there's another way we could get yellow. We could see yellow. What if we got 760 nanometer light and 530 nanometer light? If we get both of those two, then our red cones are sending red, our green cones are sending green. By the way, our red cones are sending red because of the 670 nanometer light, and the, um, the green cones are sending green because of the 530 nanometer light. And so our brain is flooded with red and green, and how does it interpret that? We already learned that. It interprets it as yellow. Okay. So when we see yellow, we could be seeing a yellow wavelength, or we could be seeing any combination of wavelengths that equally stimulates red and green, the red and green cones. So yellow is what we call a secondary color. Another secondary color would be cyan, which we get by uh, either by having 480 nanometer light reach our eye and stimulating both the, the blue-violet and the, the green cones, or by blue-violet and green light, 530 and 420, uh, stimulating both of those cones. If we get green and blue-violet being sent to our brain, we interpret it as cyan. Okay? Now, the trickiest one is probably magenta, because the magenta is what we see when we get red and blue, blue violet, red and blue violet, red and blue violet, and our brain says magenta. Now there's no single wavelength that can give you magenta, because there's no single wavelength that would stimulate the red and the blue violet. See, because anything in between would stimulate the green even more. But something that stimulates both ends, the red and the blue violet, that's what we see as magenta. Okay, so you, there's no single wavelength for magenta, and yet it's a secondary color because it's what we get when we stimulate two of the three uh, cones in our eye. Okay, so this leads to what we call an additive process. If we take, which is what we've been talking about, red light and green light, that adds together, and we get more different kinds of photons coming into our eye, and uh, we see yellow. Okay. We could also have what's called the subtractive process, which is what you're actually probably most familiar with growing up, and that is mixing paints. Well, what is a paint? A paint is 
a material that we put on a surface that when light hits it, typically white light, meaning it's got all the colors of the spectrum, when that white light hits the, the paint, some of it is absorbed. And so the question is, what is absorbed? Well, if we have magenta paint, then green was absorbed. The wavelengths that would stimulate the green cone in your eye, those are absorbed. And the blue, blue or blue-violet, and, uh, and red actually bounce off and go into our eye. And so we see magenta. We have subtracted out the green. So if we mix magenta paint, which subtracts green, with yellow paint, yellow, remember, is when green and red get stimulated. That means we've subtracted out the blue-violet. So the yellow paint subtracts out the blue-violet. The magenta paint subtracts out the green. When we mix those two together, we're going to see red. The only thing that isn't absorbed by the two... Uh, by the two types of paint. Okay, and that's called a subtractive process because we're absorbing or subtracting out colors of light. And then when we mix them together, we subtract out more colors of light. Therefore, we often call magenta, cyan, and yellow the primary pigments because mixing pigments, we're subtracting out one thing for each of those two, each of those uh, three things. And we'd call our red, green, and blue-violet, we'd call those our secondary pigments. Okay, because they're what you get when you mix two primary pigment, pigments. Because each primary pigment subtracts out one color. So if you mix them together, you're subtracting out two colors, which leaves one of the cones to be stimulated. All right, hope you had fun with that. I hope you can see the whole world in a new way as you look around at the things and imagine how your eyes are taking in light and how your brain is interpreting that as you see colors. Colors. I'm a nightmare walking, it's like about talking. All right, anyways, um, uh, we'll see you next time on the Scientific Adventures of Beard Man.